You can call me Mini Thor. <laughs> <laughs> oh my Hi, I'm Joe, and welcome to the premiere episode of Rookie Review, and what a movie to start on. A decade of dominance at the box office, six years leading towards Six Infinity Stones, finally brings us the long-awaited and highly anticipated Avengers Infinity War. Thank you, Marvel. Of course, this is a spoiler-free review, because Thanos does demand your silence. Now, we all know the plot. Thanos, the mad genocidal titan from space, is hunting down the Six Infinity Stones. You know, those colourful, nondescript gems that represent the first six singularities of existence that when combined will control and potentially destroy all life and reality in the universe. The current locations of the stones are as follows. The Space Stone was stolen by Loki at the end of Thor Ragnarok from Asgard. The Mind Stone is in the head of Vision. Unlucky dude. The Reality Stone, last seen with Benicio Del Toro's The Collector on the planet Nowhere. The Power Stone is protected by the Nova Corp on planet Xandar. The Time Stone around the neck of Doctor Strange. Unlucky dude number two. And the Soul Stone. Who knows? The threat of Thanos wishing to ensemble these stones in his gauntlet for the purpose of destroying half the life in the universe is enough to unite an ensemble of heroes never before seen in a Marvel movie. Now that's saying something. So first I just want to talk about my feelings going into Infinity War. My expectations, like most people's, were very very high. But to be honest, the expectation hasn't just came from the ravenous fans or the media, it actually came internally from Marvel themselves, because they built up Thanos the villain and the Infinity Gauntlet as a weapon a whole six years ago in the first Avengers movie. Six years of build for a villain is completely unprecedented. Considering Marvel have only accomplished a handful of legitimately great villains so far, this was arguably a risky plan and puts Josh Brolin and his performance under a lot of pressure. And to be perfectly honest, the only way this movie would live up to the hype and anticipation for me personally would be if it was an absolute game changer. And we all know what that means. Deaths, 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 and lots of them. And that's because a lot of characters have become obsolete to the overall storyline. They've overstayed their welcome and they're just cluttering up the place. The MCU needs a spring cleaning. Deaths would not only legitimise Thanos as a credible and awesome villain, but would also allow the baton to be passed on to a newer generation of lead characters and the universe could continue to develop and evolve into phase four and beyond. And it would help continue Marvel's willingness to change and adapt like no other franchise out there. It's okay to go into this movie with a healthy level of skepticism because let's face it, not every Marvel movie means it's a home run. Look at Ultron, it was an absolute mess and Infinity War could possibly stray into that area of just being too busy. Ultimately, for me, the Phase 3 movies of the Marvel Cinematic Universe have been of the highest quality. So not only did I want Infinity War to keep up the trend, but I wanted a 6 year build to pay off. As a side note, I'd say the most important MCU movies to watch in preparation for Infinity War would be Captain America Civil War, Thor Ragnarok and Black Panther. Though, if you're new to all this, you may as well just start at the beginning and watch all the movies. It's okay, it won't take long. I'll wait for you. Oh, you're back. Let's review this bad boy. So, at the beginning of the movie, the anticipation in the cinema was through the roof. There was even the obligatory whoops from the crowd. Right off the bat, the opening scene sets an ominous tone full of dread. There's none of the usual razzmatazz or musical flurry kicking off this movie, like the other Marvel movies. However, this dire tone that's initially set up, though frequent throughout the movie, doesn't overbear or engulf it. There are plenty of moments of fun action and humorous levity throughout the course of the two hour movie. I found the opening scene fantastic. It was ominous, action packed, and immediately introduced the main threat of the movie and how high the stakes are. However, one of the main drawbacks of the movie is also presented in the opening scenes, and that's the humour being a little bit forced. A lot of the humour in this movie seems out of place. Not as uneven as Thor The Dark World, but there's an overabundance of one-liners and self-referential jokes. And it's with this humour that at times it feels like Marvel Studios have been taking one too many lessons from the Deadpool school of humour. I know this works almost 100% of the time for the Guardians characters, when it comes out of the mouths of people like Doctor Strange and Bruce Banner, in the middle of a battle no less, it doesn't always pull off. And it can undermine the gravity of the dire situations the characters find themselves in, and it feels as though the MCU has taken the Guardians of the Galaxy and Thor Ragnarok approach of going for humour over seriousness, regardless of the threat being faced or the death that's just occurred on screen. The only humour that doesn't feel out of place is when it's with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Their camaraderie and banter is on point not only with one another, but with their new allies. This may be because James Gunn came aboard to help with their dialogue, but regardless, it helps to keep the characters true to themselves, even though they are all sharing the screen with 50 other cast members. When you consider the style and tone of the Russo Brothers' two Captain America movies, it was very one note, rather grounded and realistic for superhero movies, 
would deal with swapping our corrupt governments, espionage and social security for God's monsters and cosmic titans. They actually did a pretty fantastic job of taking all these different styles which are represented by the characters and fusing them into one movie. To the point that it felt like five different directors made this movie and brought their own unique styles to the table. Be it the soundtrack or score being used, the tailored dialogue or the differences in cinematic style and cinematography, you can tell immediately when the Guardians are being introduced, that we're in an Avengers compound or that it's time to revisit Wakanda. Each character presented in the movie has a different perspective, ability set and purpose. It doesn't just feel like there's just one mouthpiece that the characters have to share, so credit really does have to go to the writers of the movie, Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely, who have taken all these disparate characters who would have been introduced to the world by different writers with different voices. They took what came before, honoured it, then made it their own. I was personally looking forward to this being a two-parter, because I felt like if there's ever a franchise that deserved to take one story and drag it over two movies, it would be Marvel. I feel like one movie possibly wouldn't be enough to represent the all-out carnage and war that Marvel has promised. And so it was a little bit disappointing when they said that the fourth Avengers movie wouldn't actually be the second part of Avengers Infinity War, though it would be closely connected. I also wanted there to be time to see character arcs develop and also more importantly, brand new relationships have time to blossom. And the exciting team-ups are something that the trailers have promised us, from Thor meeting the Guardians of the Galaxy to Iron Man meeting with Doctor Strange. Aside from very minor plot points being introduced which may play out in further stories, this movie is not concerned with what is to come, but rather what the last 10 years has been building towards, and where the MCU is now. This is brilliant, and just what Thanos and the Infinity Gauntlet needed. Why should we care about a villain that was introduced 6 years ago, if when it comes to his time to shine, you're too concerned with building the next decade worth of stories? It's the actual Infinity Gauntlet that needs to be on focus in this movie, not setting up Phase 4 and the next decade of Marvel movies. Thanos is the focus. Now this is a very fast paced movie, most scenes are in service of propelling each of the multiple plots along and hurrying the characters along from one epic action set piece to the next. What is great is that Thanos gets a healthy dose of screen time, however the movie is definitely not from his perspective, there are just too many characters for there to be one main character. The cast is absolutely stacked and some of the talented actors the movie includes, even just for a few scenes, are insane. Though the scale of the movie is massive and there are multiple plot points to follow, it never feels too disparate or disjointed because you know every plot is going to the same end goal. And when one action scene is becoming a bit too relentless, it's a nice palate cleanser to move on to the other characters to see what they're up to. The concept of there being multiple storylines in the MCU seems to have informed this movie, as it feels like it's the sheer essence of the MCU condensed into one movie, as each plot point takes place in a different corner of the galaxy. Though at times it may feel like you're watching five movies in one, it all comes together in a nice conclusion. This also helps to keep the movie fresh, as when there's a lull or a lapse in one of the plot lines, you can just move on to another set of characters. And ultimately, we need these side plots to break up the intense action. Worried as to whether this would just be an action fest for two hours. This wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing, because of our decade worth of connection to some of the characters, and the fact that we can actually distinguish them from one another. I'm looking at you, Michael Bay! Because the movie's on such an epic scale, and takes place in all these different locations, at one moment it feels like you're watching something very similar to the first Avengers movie, but then the next moment it feels like you're watching a Star Wars movie, or even a Lord of the Rings movie. That's just how varied this movie is. There are certain themes that are retread here, such as heroes meeting each other for the first time and butting heads, and though it is comical and always great to see characters interact, this was something that was perfected in the first Avengers movie. It therefore felt unnecessary, and created too much angst between the characters when they already had enough going on. However, saying that, this was the first time a lot of Earthbound heroes were coming up against aliens, gods, and even legit magicians, however they just took it in their stride. And ultimately, it felt like no one was impressed with one another. Everyone was a critic. Just... Just like the internet. Hey, we've got a war to get back to. As this movie is a cosmic threat, you do have Earthbound heroes going up against villains they never usually would. At times, it feels like a little kid is just taking whatever random Marvel action figures they have and smashing them together. In the case of this movie, it always works. It's not just a globe-trotting movie, it's a cosmic-trotting movie. And it really does give emphasis to how big and epic a scale this movie's on. Even for an Avengers movie, it's impressive. And though the movie is sprawling, the plot never feels like it's spread too thin. Editing-wise, Marvel have made this movie very concise. And aside from one too many times of indulgent Deadpool-esque humour, not too much time is wasted. A lot of plot and character development seems to have happened in the space between the prior movies. I know there are some missing moments that I personally would have liked to have seen, it does mean that more time is being dedicated to moving along this plot at a brisk pace. One of my favourite aspects of the movie was seeing the stones actually being used as a weapon, but it was how they were visually represented, particularly the reality stone, and the visual flair used, 
that made the stones actually stand out and make them feel like they each had a unique and individual use and purpose rather than just the MacGuffin. Most of the side characters do actually feel like they have a purpose in this movie and they're not just being included for the sake of it. Most of the characters help in propelling the plot in one minor way or the other and the expansive cast also emphasises just how big a scale this movie is and how big a threat Thanos is. There are many occasions in this movie when characters show an absolute lapse in judgement and weakness which just don't make sense and may ultimately frustrate the fans. It may not always make sense, but considering how much action and spectacle is in this movie, it's nice to have some time dedicated to the characters. A lot of the interaction between the new partnerships is quite limited to the same pairings and team-ups, which means some fans will be disappointed and not get the specific team-ups that they wanted. Regardless, the chemistry between some of the characters is fantastic. The best example for me would have to be Thor and the Guardians of the Galaxy. And because of this, it doesn't just feel like random team-ups, it feels like genuine thought has gone into which characters will go with which. As because of these new team-ups and relationships being formed, that a lot of the characters do actually see some development in this movie. Ultimately, because of the perfect pairings, the few times in the movie that we get a break to catch our breath are some of the best scenes. And when you think about it, it's these characters that are the cornerstone of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and it's these characters that have people coming back from all over the world, this billion dollar franchise, time and time again. However, some of the drama between the characters doesn't actually work. It feels as though certain relationships have been forced and rushed, and it feels like we're being manipulated into feeling something for certain characters that we previously didn't really care about, just because something dramatic is happening in this movie. So what about the big purple dude himself, Thanos? Physically, Thanos is presented as incredibly imposing, but what makes him a credible villain is his calm temperament, his underlying sinisterness, and his penchant for death and torture. And this is all because of his unshaken belief in balance, and that what he is doing is righteous, and that he is a survivor offering mercy. The music used whenever Thanos is on screen gives this awesome sense of impending doom, in a way that hasn't accompanied any other villain in the MCU. As the movie progresses, the big purple Aki seems genuinely unstoppable, though his reasoning and motive aren't given enough time to make true sense, or offer any real understanding to the far lengths he feels he needs to go. The fact that Marvel actually put some time into giving one of their villains a purpose, aside from just being bad, with a capital B-A-D, was refreshing, and though he is completely insane, at times he makes a pretty convincing case. Thanos' relationships with his daughters is what gives Brolin a lot to chew on in particular scenes. It helps to give the character a lot of depth and gravitas, as well as some empathy. And though a lot of time and effort seems to have gone into Thanos' dialogue, there are a lot of movie cliches which seem to sneak their way in that remind you that though this is a Marvel movie, it is still a summer blockbuster as well. Josh Brolin does bring a tremendous amount of screen presence in this movie, which is quite remarkable considering he is a completely CGI character. His commanding, booming voice steals every scene that he's in, and considering he shares a lot of screen time with the charismatic likes of RDJ and Chris Pratt, that is quite phenomenal. Like any other big budget movie, the CGI can be a little bit hit and miss, however when it comes to Thanos it's always on point, it looks incredibly realistic. You can always see Brolin's amazing performance through his big purple thumb head. Thanos is most unsettling when he is calm and actually explaining his reasoning, however when he gets fired up he is the perfect representation of carnage and death to the point that feels like anything can happen at any time, which isn't how it usually goes with Marvel's quite formulaic movies. The good guy's always safe, but not necessarily in this movie. Though most of Thanos' Motley crew are nameless, characterless World of Warcraft rejects, it is the mouthpiece of the group, Ebony Moore, that does a phenomenal job of hyping up Thanos, kinda like the Paul Heyman to Brock Lesnar. The suggestive language that Ebony Moore uses gives Thanos a mature threat, of a kind of corrupted cult leader with an askewed ideology. Because of the use of such words like salvation and mercy, helps create unsettling religious undertones. I found Ebony more completely disturbing, and aside from some offish CGI here and there, I found the performance absolutely incredible and a standout character for me. So here we are at my finishing points. The cliffhanger at the end of this movie really does make it feel like the first part of a two-parter, and now we have to wait a whole year for the second half. It doesn't feel like Marvel are actually building anticipation, but rather frustration, purely because it feels like a lot of the high stakes, insurmountable odds, and destruction of this movie may be completely undermined by a quick fix at the end of Avengers 4 but we'll have to wait and see. So ultimately, I believe a review of this movie can only be done once the second part came out and we can view it as one whole story. Only then will we be sure that this movie has stood the test of time and look back upon fondly as a monumentous and groundbreaking moment in blockbuster cinema, very much like the first Avengers. Until then, we should review it for what it is, a highly enjoyable, action-packed and dramatic mashup of everything we've come to love from the MCU as well as some of the things that we've grown tired of from this franchise. There's some genuine fist-pumping moments that had the crowd cheering and considering I watched it with an English audience, that's saying something. So in this day and age of Lego movies and Ready Player Ones, we must remember that Marvel not only did it first, but they still do it best. So for Avengers Infinity War, I give it four rookie reels out of five. 
Hope you liked my first review. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. What the hell happened to Scarlet Witch's Eastern European accent? Drop quicker than Terence Howard. Hi I don't know who Terence Howard is. Okay. <laughs> Was it four? I had the right fingers went. Is it right? <laughs> you can call me Mini Thor. Mm. Oh, um. ah. Come mooning. <laughs> Yeah, boy. What do you mean? I was wishing this. Uh, progresses the big. <laughs> this is the big purple. <laughs> the big purple. <laughs> Hi, like Liked what you saw and have an interest for travel and adventure? Check out our other YouTube channel, Roman Rookies, as we travel across 14 countries in an 11 month whirlwind of fun and excitement. Just click here or the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.